Hello there, and welcome back to some more monotone ambles through the wilderness of the human mind. Today's episode is a particularly challenging one, and I've had a lot of trouble grappling with this subject matter. In many ways, this topic, the idea of consciousness, is something so obvious and intuitive. And yet, when we strive to provide a comprehensive definition of this concept, like everything in philosophy, it proves to be a strenuous endeavour. And part of this, I feel, comes down to the limits of language in its role as the mediator of experience. How does one explain the experience of seeing red to a blind person? Or what it feels like to be in love? Indeed, we all know what it is like to experience pain. But how could we translate the experience of these phenomena to another person through the medium of language? We most certainly try to when we create great works of literature which attempt to delve deep into the human psyche. And likewise, a lot of art could be thought of as delivering a similar effect, but through the medium of the visual. However, we see that whatever method we choose to attempt to convey what it is like to be human, what it is like to apprehend reality, we nearly always fail to capture the entirety of experience. Any theoretical construction of consciousness, whether through art, literature or science, simply cannot replace or fully capture the direct intuition one has of what it is like to be themselves. You have this direct access to consciousness and its contents. You are listening to something at this moment. Sound waves are entering your ear and being processed by your auditory cortex. And from these electrochemical processes in the brain emerges this weird sensation, which we call sound. Even if your entire perception were a hallucination constructed by, say, a mad scientist, you can't be mistaken about the fact that there is some kind of experience occurring. Whether or not this experience conforms to an external reality. We all seem to have immediate access to this experience of being, which I suppose is what most people seem to think of as consciousness. It's this first person subjective experience, or perhaps this awareness or perception of an inward psychological fact. And yet, the only mechanism by which we can communicate this inner fact of experience is through our behaviour. You cannot peer into my mind and observe my subjective experience. Hell, for all you know, I could not be having any conscious experience at all. I could perhaps be what is known as a philosophical zombie. This is someone who is outwardly indistinguishable from other persons, and yet inwardly they have no subjective experience. If you stabbed a philosophical zombie with a needle, he might outwardly display a pain response. He might shriek and writhe as though he were in pain. But this behavioural output would not be coupled with a subjective sensation of pain. Without going too far down the rabbit hole that comprises the philosophical zombie debate, 
I just wanted to use this example to sketch out some of the main issues that crop up when we think about the metaphysics of the mind, to use that fancy philosophy term, and how the mind really relates to consciousness. Many philosophers, they, they consider experience to be the essence of consciousness. And they believe that experience is only accessible to each individual subject. But if consciousness is subjective and not visible from the outside, why do the vast majority of people believe that other people are conscious, but pebbles and trees are not? This is what philosophers call the problem of other minds, and it captures our fallibility and the issues that arise when ascribing mental states to other people. Typically, we attribute consciousness to other people because we see that they resemble us in appearance and behavior. We reason that if they look like us and act like us, they must be like us in other ways, including having experiences of the sort that we do. But of course, since the other's subjective experience is by definition inaccessible to us directly, there is and will always be a degree of uncertainty when extrapolating mental phenomena from behavior. People may act and behave in one way whilst thinking the opposite. He may buy you flowers and send you sweet messages. However, there always remains the possibility of deceit. It is the inaccessibility of the experiences of others that lays the foundation for human deception. So, we have this direct apprehension of experience, of what it's like to be a homo sapien. And likewise, we have conceptual representations of our experience, which is what happens when we try to describe and analyze linguistically the contents of our consciousness. It's what I'm doing right now when I'm creating this podcast about consciousness, where I'm talking about, through the medium of language again, through the medium of concepts, this idea. This, is, this occurs when we create words for concepts like anger, fear, and ecstasy. This is essentially what Sigmund Freud did when he created his psychoanalytic theories of the self, where he splits our experience into the conscious, pre-conscious, and the unconscious. Freud likened these three levels of the mind to an iceberg, with the top of the iceberg that you can see above the water representing the conscious mind. This is the element of your experience that is directly accessible and available to you. It's the taste of chocolate, the sensation of seeing blue, the sound of music. This element of your mind could be thought of as a model of the contents of your attention. That is, you have the capacity to attend to any one of the sensory elements that are present in your experience. Think for a second about your feet. Now I'm no psychic, but I can reasonably predict that a shift of attention occurred at that moment. You probably felt the fabric of your socks, or the compress of your shoes against your feet. The point is that our conscious experience is punctuated by these shifts of attention, and there is practically an infinite 
amount of things one could potentially attend to in their environment. And through attending to one thing or another, you neglect the other elements of your experience. They fade into the background. You could think of our attention, in this sense, as necessarily discriminatory. And of course it is useful that it is this way. Deficiencies in this attentional system would likely manifest in a radically scattered mind with the currents of our stream of consciousness being wild and untamed. Such symptoms form the core diagnostic criteria for ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And of course, we all differ in our capacity to attend to one thing or another. Some of us can achieve a degree of hyperfocus when engaging with a particular task for hours on end, whilst others struggle considerably. Contrast those Buddhist monks who are able to meditate for dozens of hours a day, focusing only on the breath, with those of us today who are unable to go 30 seconds on a particular task without reflectively pulling out TikTok. The ability to attend will vary significantly in a population, and underlying these differences are differences in the neural circuits that form our attentional modules. We all have different brains, and with that, different capacities, limitations and tendencies. A necessary corollary of the fact that we have different brains it's the fact that our experience will likely differ as well. If your brain produces more dopamine than mine when tasting chocolate, that would likely mean that your experience of chocolate is qualitatively different to mine. Now, would that mean that your taste sensation of the chocolate is quote-unquote better? Or that you find the experience of chocolate more pleasurable than I do. If your elevated dopamine response means you pursue chocolate more than I do, I suppose we could conclude that you desire it more. But how much one pursues chocolate is a behavioural measure. It doesn't provide insight into what the experience of chocolate is like for you. Indeed, what I'm touching on again are the issues that crop up when trying to extrapolate from our conceptual understanding of the brain, the world of neurons and neurotransmitters, to our intuitive experience of reality. This is what philosophers call the hard problem of consciousness. It's the great mystery that comes with explaining how and why we have experience, or what philosophers sometimes call qualia. Qualia is simply these individual instances of consciousness. Examples could include the perceived sensation of the pain of a headache or the redness of an apple. This notion of qualia, or our intuitive experience, the way things appear to us, is in contrast to the quote-unquote easy problems of consciousness, which involve explaining the physical systems that give us and other animals the ability to integrate and process information. Even if we understood the exact mechanisms that underlie taste perception, all the neural pathways from the taste receptors of the tongue to the somatosensory cortex, even if we knew all there is to know about the physical systems underlying taste, if the hard problem of consciousness persists, there remains an un bridgeable gap 
between our understanding of the physical and our understanding of experience. Experience in this sense is irreducible. You simply cannot provide a complete account of it in terms of lower levels of explanation. So if our experience cannot be reduced to any notions of neurons and neural circuits, does that mean that it is something entirely different? That the world of the physical and the world of the mental are two distinct substances and thus can be separated? This is the core principle of mind-body dualism and this is the theory that the mental and the physical or the mind and body or the mind and brain are in some sense radically different kinds of things. Any conception of an afterlife requires that one holds this conception of the mind and body, that the mind can exist independent of the brain. But is dualism a coherent theory of our consciousness? Is it really conceivable to imagine consciousness independent of the brain? Perhaps it is more accurate to think of the mind as emergent from the operations of the brain. Now, this emergence occurs when an entity is observed to have properties its parts do not have on their own. Properties or behaviours which emerge only when the parts interact in a wider whole. No individual neuron has consciousness. However, when you have the complex interactions of billions of neurons in the brain, consciousness emerges as a result. And when we undergo alterations in consciousness, when we go under a general anaesthetic, or consume a psychedelic compound. Such changes in consciousness are underpinned by changes in the neural circuitry from which our experience emerges. Now I think consciousness is best conceived as a, a simulated model of reality produced by our brain. Sensory data is received and processed by the brain and from this information our brain constructs a simulation or virtual reality of our external world. It does this in order to coordinate optimal behaviour. Now, this brings up the question of why would a biological system need to be conscious in order to respond to challenges in its environment? Indeed, a lot of our survival needs are met without the intervention of our conscious awareness. You likely don't have much conscious insight into your liver or heart function. Much of this biological regulation is conducted automatically. What is available to our conscious awareness is but a small sliver of all the complex computations that form a biological system. So in consideration of the fact that the majority of our biological operations are conducted beneath our conscious awareness automatically. What is the purpose of having a conscious awareness at all? Why not have everything be automatic? The answer to this question is not an easy one, but I believe some insight can be found by thinking of consciousness as a model 
of the contents of our attention or as a control module for our attention. We're not just mere apes, but rather the side effects of the regulation needs of apes. The purpose of consciousness in this sense is to resolve conflicts that face the organism which can't be addressed by autonomic or automatic processes. These are conflicts which require the higher order intervention of attention. Attention, or what one chooses to attend to, helps to resolve these higher order conflicts, these regulation needs, and from that initiate optimal behavior responses. Consciousness, in this sense, is a mechanism that has evolved for a certain type of learning. It singles out features and performs conditional operations for which it needs an index memory. And it is this index memory that we perceive as the stream of consciousness. We notice where we are looking and can influence how we put things together in our mind. And beneath this attentional model lies what I think is best construed as a cybernetic motivational system. This is what provides us with motivation and urges. The urges to pursue food, sex and safety. It provides us with a criteria for what we ought to attend to. Our mind is the software implemented by our brain which creates the universe, or rather our universe. Our consciousness is the attentional system which operates in service of our primate motivational system. We are in some respects monkeys sitting on elephants. The monkey in this metaphor being consciousness and the elephant being the agent, the motivational system, as it stomps around in our environment. It's important to recognize that we form, we are the agent. We, we discover that we have a body, that we are situated in a particular environment, and that we have a first person experience. We are the combination of a perceptual system, which models our brain's best guess as to what forms our surroundings, and also a motivational system, which dictates how we ought to act within these surroundings. All of this is just a software state implemented by our brains. And we are that software state. We are thrown into life as the software state on the brain of a random ape for a few decades. That is, my friends, the human condition. We don't choose which brain or the conditions that the brain finds itself in. We just have to make do with the brain we happen to operate on. It's certainly not the worst brain to run on. Thank you guys for listening. Have a good day.